Hi everybody, and welcome to another Grayscale Gorilla tutorial. All the time in AskGSG, I get questions about moving things from one place to another. There's a lot of really cool conveyor belt type animations, and we're gonna try and tackle that now. Hi everybody, I'm Christian, and welcome to another Grayscale Gorilla tutorial where we do tips, training, and uh, tools to help make you a better motion designer. Today, we are going to be tackling a couple of different techniques to do conveyor belts. How do we make them move? How do we make them animate? How do we make them move? How do, how do we make things travel along them? So a bunch of different things to tackle. So uh, this actually originated as a question from AskGSG, and there's some... You can make it complicated, you can make it simple, and we're going to try and do both versions of that. So why don't we go right on in and jump into Cinema 4D. Now, uh, we don't want to, uh, we could use a cube, but I actually had a model prepped that, let me pop this open. So I have a model that I made back in the day for actually a SIGGRAPH presentation. So at SIGGRAPH, if you go check out my SIGGRAPH presentation, I think from maybe 2015, I went and I did a thing about unwrapping UVs and I unwrapped the UVs of this little wooden crate and this little wooden barrel. I thought it'd be kind of cool just to make this be our object instead of a generic cube. We can actually have a cool little crate. So uh, go and check out that. Uh, go check out that SIGGRAPH presentation if you want to see how I put together the UVs on this model. So uh, right away, uh, actually just one thing, I want to make sure that my axis is in the center for this. So I'm going to make sure to zero out my axis and rotation. Cool. So now, oops, actually it doesn't even seem to be centered. I thought it would be, but go ahead and easy enough to fix. It's a square, so I can just zero those out and that should be zeroing of that if I didn't have axis on. Cool. Do that, do that, do that. Cool. Anyway, now I've got my cube. That explains why my test was being a little bit weird. I didn't realize it did that. Cool, so right away I'm going to go ahead and save this and we're just going to jump in the conveyor belt and we'll just call this conveyor belt one. Cool, and now what are we going to be doing? On this, on this one, we're going to be doing a very simplified version where there's nothing dynamic going on. We just have a track we wanna travel and we're gonna hand animate it. We want maybe a lot of precision. So we're going to do that by creating a rectangle which is great for turning on rounding and getting nice rounded edges. So a good setup here is doing something like setting a height and then a nice big rounding, which eats up the entire space. And you see that we have a nice big rounded oval pill shape. So I'm actually going to leave that kind of small and I shrink our crate even tinier. Just so we're working with a relatively small scale here. Cool, I'm gonna move that up in the air and now you can see we've got this belt. We need to travel something around that belt to give it some geometry. So I'm actually gonna go ahead and create a rectangle so we got our rectangle here i always guess wrong i think we're gonna make this really not very wide but we'll make it decently long and now we can go and grab a sweep of course and drop those two in there and I actually guess correctly this time which is it's going to be sweeping along the entire thing and the reason i used a rectangle is it's going to give us a little bit of depth on there there's a little bit of a thickness which is definitely a plus now we need to see this belt spinning around, and there's lots of different ways we could do that. I mean, first of all, we could just turn on our geometry and see the way it looks like it's spinning around. But the way I want to do this one is with a material. So I'm going to go ahead and make a new material, and a simple way to do it if you just want to see it is you could do something like create a gradient. I think we have to change it to 2D V instead of U. And now if I were to apply this, you're going to see it stretching all the way along. So if we were to spin it, you can actually see it rotate. And if you wanted to, you could go and grab it and tell it to loop a few times. So you could very clearly see that. I think I might want to make a slightly fancier version of a material. So what I'm actually going to do, just because I think it's a comparable material to what I want, is I'm actually going to grab, jump into Grayscale Gorilla Texture Kit. And I'm going to go into the Texture Kit and I'm going to go into Plastics. And I'm actually going to open up this blue tarp material. Now we made all of these tileable. Ooh, wait, am I in R19? And I might not have linked my textures in that one. Apparently I didn't link my textures, which is simple enough to do. Preferences. And then we go to uh, files. And then we have, yeah, see, I, don't, I have all my paths emptied out. Now. So when I copied all my plugins over, I didn't copy that in. So it's always a good idea to make the first one texture and then make the next one. I'm going to go and track down the texture kit stuff. So I'm actually gonna switch the screen for a second. And I'm going to go and jump into my Dropbox and not let you guys see all the crazy secret projects we're working on in there. Boom. 
cool. And now, nice. Now I'll switch back and we'll clip that little bit out. Okay, so I linked the texture. So we're gonna joke, go ahead and do that a little cleaner, I guess, so I'll say. So I, uh, the we have a plastic material I think will go a long way for that. So I'm gonna jump into presets and I'm gonna go into texture kit. Inside a texture kit, we've got plastic inside a plastic. We have a blue tarp. If I drag that in, you're gonna see it's gonna pop right on in. And the blue tarp has a nice kind of tiling plastic material look. So what I'm actually gonna do is jump in the material and almost all the materials that we have are based off of images. We put it into a filter so you can drag that filter down, desaturate it. And I actually want it to be almost entirely black. So I'm actually gonna fade this out a lot. So you can see I just get a little bit of this texture pushing through. And in fact, our bump might be a little strong. So I'm gonna pull back on that. But anyway, that should give me a material that I can go and swap this one out for. And now we've got a tiled material on there. It just gives us a little bit of texture, something so we can see it's actually rotating. Excellent. Now, the main way that we're going to make this tr this conveyor belt travel is going to be by animating the texture. We're not actually going to change the geometry at all. So the way we're going to do that is if we click on our texture tag, we have a offset U and an offset V. And we already know that V is the one we've been stretching, so it's probably offset V that we want to move. And you'll see when I click on that and drag it that that now looks like it is spinning around. It's as simple as that. We've got one parameter to make that conveyor belt look like it's spinning. So it would be really cool to use signal on this, but we'll use that later. So in this version, we're not going to use signal. So we're going to start out by making this continuously move at a constant speed. It's going to, everything's going to be easier to, if it's a constant speed. So I'm going to go ahead and hit Command or Control D, which is going to open up the project settings. And I'm going to go to Key Interpolation. And inside of here, by default, it's set to spline. You know, it makes everything kind of smooth into each other. I'm going to set it to linear. So everything just moves in a straight line, no acceleration, no deceleration. But all that that means is when I record keyframes here, so I'm gonna record a keyframe, let's fast forward to the very end. And then let's say that I wanted that to spin, I don't know how much, so let's just say 100% and record. It is a linear move. So if I hit play, it's gonna spin around exactly once over the course of 90 frames. Now looking at this, it's actually pretty fast. We can actually see this is spinning around very quickly. So that's too much. So it's relatively straightforward to fix that. If we click on the keyframe, you can see that we get our values in here and it says, how far did that go? So as an alternative, we can actually lengthen our timeline and that's probably something we're gonna be doing anyway. So if I jump this timeline up to about 300 long and then stretch it out, if you double click on the final dot or anywhere on it really, it'll jump to the full length. So now we've got a a longer timeline, and you see this all the way at the beginning. Now, if I were to grab this dot and just pull it all the way to the end, go to 300, you could also just type in 300 right there. Now, it will be moving at a third to speed. It's traveling the same distance, but it's taking three times as long to get there. So you can see we get something a little bit more reasonable. Now, right away, let's say we wanted the conveyor belt to be traveling to the right instead of the left. That's pretty straightforward as well. All we have to do is grab that final keyframe and change the value. We recorded it at 100, but we could actually switch it over to negative 100, and now it's going the opposite direction. So that works actually pretty well. It's pretty straightforward. And we've got this little spinning conveyor belt looking thing. Now, this method is going to involve kind of a lot of just guessing. We're gonna guess values and then tweak them until they look like they're sort of matching up. So. For instance, let's say we wanted some roller tubes on here. Like it's not gonna look like a proper conveyor belt, even if it's just kind of magically floating in the air. It's not gonna look like a conveyor belt unless we give it something to be rolling on. So we wanna be able to see what it's rolling on. So I'm gonna make a cylinder and I'm gonna copy the cylinder inside of itself. And then this one I'm gonna make a little bit longer. Let me get a little skinnier. And then I'm going to copy that inside of itself. And this one, we're going to change the orientation. And I'm gonna scoot over here, hit T for scale and scale it down. And that's just gonna become like a little pin in there uh, as if it's holding in these, uh, you know, this rod through there. But what that means is we can actually see the spin. Building that was just a way of being able to see this will be rotating. So cool, that is rotating, or it's not rotating, it's ready to rotate. And if I spin that a little bit, you can see the axis we want to spin on is B. So let's grab the B. And at the beginning, say, let's record on B. Let's fast forward to the end and then record on B again. We know we're spinning that way. So if we increase the amount, it is it does look correct. I have no idea what value we need, so I'm just going to guess, 360. And let's go ahead and even position this a little bit better. In fact, before I even move the position, I'm going to group it. I'm going to Alt or Option G. 
and it's going to group it into a null, which is in the exact same position as itself. And what that means is the cylinder can be spinning, but we can always grab our null and move that to wherever we want to, and it won't, won't mess with the spinning. So let's just go ahead, and a lot of these are going to be eyeballing. So I move this to the end, and we're seeing this spin, and this belt definitely feels like it's spinning a lot more than that is. Now, there is probably some relatively straightforward math you could do to make sure that this is exact, but it's, I don't know, it's, it's so easy to guess and check on this that I don't even bother. If we select that keyframe, I have that cylinder selected, and I'm even going to rename that cylinder rotation, just so I know that that's the one that's animated, that's the one that's rotating. All we have to do is grab this final keyframe here, and uh, I'm going to click somewhere in the blank and just kind of drag over it. Now I select it. There's only one keyframe there. And because it's only one keyframe on one axis, it gives us the, the direct value. So I can do things like, say, times two, and we're going t twice as fast now. And twice as fast is actually looking pretty dang good. That is looking, as far as my eyeballs can tell me, that is really close to being right on top of it. So I am happy with that. So we got that spinning, and now it looks like the belt is spinning on it. We can go ahead and grab this, and I'm going to rename it Roller and even give this another quick save. We can go ahead and copy and paste that, or we could even create an instance of it. And because we put the animated part inside of a null, the roller will still be animated. The, I mean, I'm sorry, the instance of this roller will be animated as well. But if we had made an instance of the cylinder, the actual thing that was rotating, the instance is kind of a new copy of it. So it has its own position and rotation, which means it wouldn't be spinning. So this is kind of a cool way by putting in the null of instance, instancing that down. And the other thing that's cool, obviously, is whenever we... Uh, if I pause this especially, it's going to be easy to grab this and change some of these parameters. Like maybe this pin is a little bit too big. It's calling too much attention to itself. So I can go and shrink that up a little bit. And maybe that one's still a little big. And both of them are going to update. So just a little something to help that along. Now, poly counts don't matter too much. This is We're not doing anything dynamic. But um, some of these cylinders, like that tiny one, typically I'd probably make that a lot. We don't need as many polygons there because it's a smaller object. Probably drop it down to something like 16. You wouldn't really be able to tell that there was fewer polygons. That kind of stuff is important if you're going to copy stuff and put them in cloners and make a whole bunch of different things. So uh, all this is going really well so far. We can grab our height on this conveyor belt, and we can stretch it long enough so it kind of looks like it's covering the entire thing. That automatically, I think, makes it look a lot better. And that is pretty, that's pretty good. It's kind of ready to rock. Now, why don't we go ahead and create a null, and I'm going to put everything inside of it except for the crate so we'll put that inside here we'll just call this belt one and now i can go ahead and copy and paste this and let's go ahead and make a duplicate of it maybe let's see how do we want to do it i'm going to have it just fall down here and travel along a second belt but the second belt will be a lot longer so let's grab this and let's make this one twice as long so it'll set to 800 and i'm going to grab our one roller, and let's just eyeball it once again. I'm going to pull it so it looks like in the proper spot. Grab this roller, drag it, look like it's in the proper spot. We can probably move this over a little bit to eat up the lost space. Cool. And let's make maybe, let's make one more belt. I'm going to go ahead and copy and paste this one. And actually, before we do that, let's, let's hit play and see what we got right now. So if you look, we made this twice as long. But it's visually, it is now moving twice as fast. It looks like it's going too fast now because it's traveling twice the distance for one spin. So what we actually want to do is make sure that we grab that texture. And now I've got that texture selected so I can make sure, I think that it's going to give us the proper bar right here. And yes, you can see it is at negative 100. We actually want that to go at half the speed. So I'm going to say negative 50. So now it's gone at half the speed, but that at half the speed is identical to this one at full speed. So important uh, little details there to note. So now we've got that. Let's go ahead and rename that belt two. Let's go ahead and copy and paste it. And uh, this one, I'm actually going to hold down shift and spin it around 180. So it's the same length. So we don't have to change speed, but it's going the other direction. And this one, I'll just maybe rotate it, let's say 20 degrees there. And I'm gonna move it over here. So now we've got, uh, belt is it will fall here it'll move forward hit there move forward hit there move down and then fall out of the scene let's say that's our belt setup so one thing to point out is, that, out is right away you see we've got a pretty simple setup here we made one and we can copy and paste it and make more it's not terribly difficult to make additional ones and we got stuff like this instance if we wanted more rollers in there i could copy and paste that instance and add another roller right there in the middle we could also do things like put them in the cloner. Let's try that maybe with this middle one. I'm going to delete the instance. 
And I'm going to grab this one, and let's go ahead and create a cloner. I'm going to make that a child of that belt, which should be centered. So I'm going to zero out this cloner's position, so it's actually right there in the middle. Let's put the roller inside the cloner, and this cloner, we can go and set that to a grid array. We, don't, we only want one vertically, and we only want one on Z. So we'll drop that down. So now you see we got three rollers, and now I can pull these and grab the dot or grab our size X and increase this so it looks like it's perfectly matching again. And then what's cool is we can just type in whatever number we want here and we'll get the exact number of rollers. And because the exact same way the instance, because the rotating part is the cylinder, that means that the roller is what's getting cloned. So those should automatically also be rotating and so that's, it's just well set up to be able to do that kind of thing. And because we spun this one 180, it actually rotated everything correctly the other direction. We don't have to reverse the speed, although we could have reversed the speed by setting it. The, the belt right now is going at negative 100. We could have set it to positive 100. Cool. So that, all that is working well. Let's get some product traveling on here. And the product being these little crates. So we get these tiny little baby crates, or maybe these are big giant conveyor belts. I'm not sure which. But I'm going to go ahead and click my middle mouse button, and let's go to a side view here, and we're going to do this one like a very manual way. Let's say we want this very precise and exact, and everything go exactly where we're telling it to. So we're going to draw a spline. So we're actually going to do a, I think, a relatively generic version of this, where it's just going to be a straight line. It's going to fall down. And then once it hits there, it's going to be a perfectly hard angle that will travel forward. And now I want to go right here, pretty much right where that line is, go right above that and pull a nice handle out to pretty much get a perfect curve around this thing. And then right on this halfway point, right about the size of the crate, I want to pull out that. You can see I get a nice even arc there, trying to match that as best as possible. We'll be able to change that so we don't have to stress out over it. But now let's it's gonna fall down and then we'll jump over here, do that exact same thing again, drag it out. Drag it up. Now this one is going to fall down here and then travel. Do a very similar thing, but our angles will be a little bit different. And it's really cool with the new splines. You can hold down Alter Option, and I'm clicking my middle mouse button to navigate, and it doesn't break the spline. You used to not be able to do that. But I'm going to click and drag. Pretty similar handle, but then this one isn't going to go to that perfect edge. It's actually going to be the tangent, which is probably going to be right around there. Let's pull that up. And let's go pretty much straight down. Let's just let them fall out of the scene. Now, these are not going to be precise at all. Right, right here, I can see that this isn't lined up. And the whole, like, they might be off all over the place. But now we've got a nice basic spline for these to travel. And let's see how we did. So uh, we are going to, well, we could align to a spline. We could just grab this one crate and we could align it to a spline and have it travel that way. But. We can actually get a lot of stuff for free here if we use a cloner. And because it's a conveyor belt and I think there'd be a bunch of objects traveling on it, let's go ahead and do it with a cloner. So I'm going to put the crate in the cloner, grab the cloner. We're going to set the cloner to be based off of an object. And the object is going to be this spline. The instant we do that, you're going to say, boom, it's going to clone a bunch of things on there. But it's cloning them onto the points. We don't want it on the points. We want it to be stepped or even. I'm going to set the step. I like step where it's pretty much saying every 100 units make another one. I don't want that many, so I'm going to set it to every 200 units. But now you can see that it's gone and cloned one of these onto every single, well, every 200 units, it makes another one. Now, another uh, one of the best parts of putting this into a cloner to do this is it has a rate. And we can just type in an amount here, and if I hit play, those will be moving. So we get all this motion for free without having to align them. Now, you will see actually right here there's two crates that are intersecting each other and that's just kind of a it's it's going to happen based on your step but if we change our step amount to the point where actually i can even push it up if we push it up enough it's going to kind of pop through and cease to exist and jump to the next one so the spacing ends up being kind of even you could have also have pulled it down to be further so there's more even spacing looking in there but it's just kind of the coincidence of doing this method. I think maybe if you did even, it'd be a little bit different, but that's a way of getting rid of that. So these are now moving constantly. Let's go to a our side view, and I just want to see if it looks like they're moving the right speed. They look, they look like they're moving a little fast, so we're going to slow that down. That's really easy by just ticking that down. Let's say a rate of four, still too fast. Rate of three, pretty close. It looks like they are getting a little ahead of it. I think two will be too slow, though, so we're going to have to go a little decimal pointy here. Let's do 2.5. And we got to keep in mind, we hit the end of the thing, it's going to pop back. It's still a little bit slow, actually. So I'm going to do 
that's looking really close. I'm sure there's something, there's a little bit more to it, but uh, that is really dang close. Now, there's another thing I want to point out right here. If you watch these crates rotate here, do you see how it's kind of doing these little pops where it's like pop, 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 pop. There's a checkbox called smooth rotation, and that will smooth those out where that will do a transition. But that actually creates a problem here because this is now doing a smooth rotation as well, where it's changing from one orientation to another. So we're going to be dealing with that in a little bit. But it looks like those are working pretty well. I'm actually going to turn off that smooth rotation because I want to see these, uh, how far off we are. Now, it actually looks like I overall was assuming the crate was a little bigger than it is. So we could move all the spline, but I think it's going to be easier to just scale up the crate. So I'm scaling up the crate until it looks like we're pretty dang close there. And because I drew that spline pretty carefully, it's doing a pretty decent job here. We got a pretty decent job of these following kind of properly. It looks like they might intersect here a little bit and you could go and tweak and tweak and change these. I'm not going to super stress out over those right now, but you know, you, I could pull it up a little and make sure those aren't quite passing through. It rotates down. That actually seems to go pretty well. So overall, I'd say that was actually a pretty decent setup there. We're going to get an infinite rotation here that will go on forever, at least as far as those are concerned. But because we keyframe these uh, conveyor belts, if we lengthen up our timeline, we would have to stretch those out or set some sort of loop points on them. And I don't, I haven't even done that in a while. It might not even be super hard to, to do. But yeah, you don't get it for free in here. But in any case, let's talk about some of these rotations, especially stuff like right there. You see, we get these pops right where that happens. Um, and then you see one right here it's actually popping 90 degrees. So what we would do to deal with this kind of thing would be to create a rail spline. So I'm gonna go ahead and we've got our spline right here. I'm going to copy and paste it. And let's go ahead and rename this one rail. And we're going to feed it into the cloner and you'll see there's actually a rail spline spot for that. Let's go ahead and drop that in. And now when we drop the rail spline in and it's identical, it actually doesn't change anything. But what we want to do now with the rail spline is change where a bunch of these points exist. So I'm actually gonna go back to our side view here. Make sure we go to our selection tool and I'm gonna go ahead and grab all of our points except for the first one and the last one. And actually, if you did wanna grab everything except for the first one and the last one, the cool little shortcut would be hit Command A, select all, and then UK, the shortcut for shrink. And now we shrank and you see we grabbed everything except for the bottom two. But now I could do something like pull all the stuff up. So that's the rail spline pointing up. And then we wanna go and kind of, oop, I wanna hit space bar to go back to our selection tool. And I wanna select these points and these points. And what I wanna do is pull those farther out so you can see that the curve is actually further out. We're, we're kind of saying if it was pointing upward at this equivalent rail, where would we want that to go? So that's what we've got going there. And we have to fix this final one. I think it's safe to go and move this over there like this. And I might be a little bit, yeah, we still have this pop happening right here where those are rotating. So we can hopefully fix that by grabbing these first two points. And would we pull them forward or or do we need some curve in there? Let me think. Yeah, actually, maybe what that ends up needing... Hmm, that's actually kind of curious. I don't remember specifically how I dealt with this when I kind of did a test. But if we round those a little bit, maybe, I'm going to say um, we could do a chamfer. So we grab a chamfer, and let's pull that out, and we're going to round those edges. And then we still get this very pretty harsh pop there. Now, are these rails doing anything is a question. So I'm actually going to go and click on... I'm going to undo. I don't want that... To, I don't want the chamfer if we don't need it. And I, we might actually need to turn on our target. Interesting. Well, that's going all completely off the rails. Don't turn on smoothing. Uh, I thought maybe the target would work. And bef let me think, what is actually causing those rotational pops? Because it is pretty important. We say don't align. That's a, 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 well, yeah, you can't do that. I was going to say uh, you can do a cheat by turning off a line, and that works for these straight ones, but that doesn't work too well for this one because it would need to rotate on there. Although there are ways we could get around that as well. Um, the, I'm trying to think of what this pop was doing. Maybe that was always happening before, and I didn't realize it. I want to move on to some more interesting bits rather than trying to troubleshoot this tiny thing here. And if we were, like one thing I'm thinking is if we were to grab both of those points and put a little bit of an arc in them, 
let's put the chamfer in both of them. Then it's going to give us a little bit of an arc there. So we actually have something we can rotate, which definitely is doing something for us. And then I'm wondering if we would want these points to be lined up in the center there, but up higher. Hmm, interesting. I'm going to go ahead and just leave it at that little curve happening right there. And actually doesn't, that actually still works okay with another thing I wanted to show you guys. Um, especially when it came to, especially when it comes to a lot of those cool contraptions you see that people make. And are we at the step where I'd even talk about that already? Um, maybe actually, but uh, I guess we're also kind of getting that pop right there. We get the nice little curve. Yep. We don't want the curve, we want it straight. Hmm. I'm actually a little stumped there, guys, but everything else is working really well. But I was going to say, as far as when you see the contraption stuff, people are always hiding the seams. And that's, I mean, I'm essentially going to call that a seam. So one quick way of hiding that seam would be do something like create a tube shape. So what we would do is change this outer radius, maybe the inner radius. Let's make this a little bit taller. And then we could go and put that right here as if it's kind of like a little contraption that's catching those boxes. And then we can grab a cylinder shape or even a box and create this box shape. Let's grab this and put it right there. And now we can make a bool. Put those both in there. Backwards. Switch it. Cool. So now you get a hole. So now you see it kind of falls in there and then stuff happens and then it comes out. So that's a way that a lot of those animations hide their seams is to kind of have, and along those lines, we, we went to a lot of trouble of like showing some arcs here and drawing the lines out. But you could just have that be a straight line and it falls in there and then this does that curve and then it falls into something else. And you could just be falling into contraption after contraption into like thing that hides the seams. So you just put that there and boom, those boxes are magically appearing from in there and it doesn't look wrong. And then we put one right down here and now they're falling into that tube and it doesn't look wrong. So that kind of thing could be pretty cool, pretty straightforward to set up, you know, to put those and once you have these animated and moving them along. Now, an important thing to point out is something that's kind of a pain is let's say you wanted to make these go twice as fast or you wanted to like change anything. Everything needs to be changed to update to it. You'd have to change all the speeds of the conveyor belt. You have to change the speed of the spinning cylinders. You'd have to change the speed of the boxes moving. So that all that could be a bit of a pain. Um, but we have a completely different, unrelated, dynamic approach we can tackle. And we're going to do that in part two. So I'll see you guys there.